Hello and welcome to Straightforward, Levant TV's political debate show focusing on matters that matter in the Middle East. This time we will be reflecting on events and discussing their implications and ramifications. Events of 2014, a year that witnessed remarkable events in the region. Egypt and Tunisia dropped Islamism, and two years after President Obama declared Assad's days are numbered, CM President Bashar al-Assad wins a landslide victory and is in for another seven-year term. These and the rather unsuccessful Kerry initiative have imposed question marks over America's role in the world as the indispensable nation. The case of Palestine gains momentum in Europe and more events that we will be looking at with our guests here at the studio, Dr. Simon Waldman, political scientist and lecturer at King, King's College, good to have you again, and Mr. George D. Hishous uh, from the Centre of Turkey Studies here in London, welcome on the show. Thank you very much. So before we delve into our discussion, let's have a look at this brief report on a tumultuous year. The Middle East witnessed numerous game-changing events this year, with the deadliest 50-day war in Gaza, the rise of the wealthiest terror group in history in Iraq and Syria, and presidential elections held throughout the region. Syria's presidential election in June saw incumbent Bashar al-Assad re-elected in a landslide victory, securing another seven-year term. But neighbouring Lebanon still remains in a presidential vacuum following the end of Michel Slayman's term and after seven months, a 16th round of voting is now scheduled. In Syria's other neighbouring country, Turkey, Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan became president in a landslide victory in the first direct presidential election in August, extending his 12-year grip on power and securing a mandate to fulfil his pledge of creating a new Turkey. Almost a year after the June 2013 protest that prompted Abdel Fattah al-Sisi to depose Egypt's then-president Mohamed Mursi in a military-led coup, Sisi won 96.9% of votes and became Egypt's new president. More than three years since longtime ruler Zine al Abidin bin Ali was ousted by a popular uprising in Tunisia, Tunisians voted for the first directly elected president in the state's transition to full democracy. The voting followed October's general election when the main secular Nida Tunis party won the most seats in the parliament, beating the Islamist party in Nahda. With the Islamist party willing to cooperate in the next stage, the country now awaits the second round, which will see Beji say the Sepsi stand against outgoing interim president Monsef Marzouki. In the face of increasing advances from ISIS and growing concerns of sectarian divisions, Iraq's Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki agreed to leave office, ending a political impasse and paving the way for Parliamentary Deputy Speaker Haider al-Abadi to take over. But Iraq's problems didn't end there. ISIS's increasing advances resulted in Iraq's minority Christians and Yazidis being attacked and driven out. ISIS established itself as one of the wealthiest terror groups in history, taking in more than £1 million a day through ransom, oil smuggling, extortion, theft and human trafficking. ISIS's growth also led to US military involvement and the formation of a US-led coalition which included five Arab states striking militant-held areas in Syria and Iraq. But the US involvement didn't just focus on ISIS in battled areas. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry frequented trips to Palestine and Israel in a bid to rescue faltering peace talks. But with the failure of the peace talks and increased settlement announcements from Israel, escalation from the two sides saw one of the deadliest conflicts in Gaza. But how will all these events reshape the near future in the Middle East? And how will they be observed when it comes to the West's policy in the region? Dr. Simon Waldman, if I may start in reverse chronology, from yesterday's news at the State of Palestine becomes an International Criminal Court non-state observer. What do you have to say about that? Well, um, you're correct that it's become a non-state observer. An observer is a very important word here. What that means is until um, Palestine signs the Rome um, um, statute, then it cannot really make any kind of actions in the ICC against alleged war crimes on the part of Israel. So it's a first step of a, of a longer kind of process, if you like. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, George de Jesus, uh, what do you think of the momentum Palestine is gaining in the West this year, especially when it comes to recognizing it as a state, for example? I think it's without a doubt a good sign. Um, I think it's not enough. Good no, for no. everybody? It's good for uh, peace in the region because mm -hmm. there's one thing that up until now 
um, Western foreign policy, in particular American po foreign policy, has failed to realize is that truly long-lasting peace between Israel and Palestine can only be achieved if both parties are negotiating from the same level, mm -hmm. from the same starting point, mm -hmm. which is not happening because Israel um, is recognized as an independent sovereign state um, and with that comes certain rights and certain privileges, um, whereas Palestine is not. And so if you try to reach a um, peace in, in, in this current situation, um, well then, Israel will always come out winning. So mm -hmm. you, we need Palestine to be recognized mm -hmm. by the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Waldman, how effective will Palestine be, especially <coughs> when a poll suggests that 83% of Palestinians do support trying to file charges at the International Criminal Court at The Hague against Israeli re leaders and officials? Well, it's an interesting case. I, I certainly agree that when you look at the relationship between Israel and Palestine, these are not equal parties. One is a state and one is at best a proto-state. Israel holds all the cards on the table. It always will. It's very difficult to find a way of them having some kind of equal level of parity to negotiate on the same level. So what the Palestinians are trying to do is to use international institutions as a mean of gaining this equal leverage. In other words, this move is an attempt to gain leverage later on, possibly this month, at the Security Council of the United Nations for the Security Council to actually accept Palestine as a state and have some kind of time frame for uh, a solution to be found between Israel and the Palestinians. Now, the problem with this is that, well, yes, let's say the Palestinians do go all the way and they file complaints at the ICC. <coughs> what this may do is make Israel do the same thing. And this could be very embarrassing to the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. um, war, war crimes charges could be filed against Hamas. Mm -hmm. um, it could even be uh, filed against the Palestinian Authority for incitement. Mm -hmm. um, and what this means for the actual peace process is really, really difficult to mm -hmm. tell. But is Hamas a representative of the state here to, for, for, for people to file charges against Hamas? You're not filing them against the state of Palestine, even though it does not exist. Do you think that the International Criminal Court would take any such files well, for an organization, organization that has been affiliated with uh, sometimes terrorism? So, Well, I think also another question is, does the ICC want to be dragged into a political battle between Israel and Palestine? Mm -hmm. This is a, a court which was established to um, investigate, charge war criminals. This is a very, very serious matter. Um, is it about you know, uh, a, a proto-state trying to get leverage against uh, a state which occupies its territory? That's not what it's supposed to be mm. about. In the case of Hamas, don't forget at the moment, it is in some kind of interim government mm. in terms of the Palestinian Authority. So it's a very gray area, and that would be up to the ICC to establish that. Mm. And now we are joined uh, by Mr. Joseph Barakat of the Lebanese Forces Party, who will touch a little bit on Lebanon. Welcome back to the show, Mr. Barakat. Thank you very much, Carl. What are the main elements, in your opinion, behind the delay in electing a president in the Lebanon? I mean, it's, it was uh, unfortunately a custom that, uh, uh, to choose a president which is uh, an, an very good, uh, on very good terms with the Syrian regime. Uh, for the past uh, a few times, and uh, now Lebanon is changing because uh, large part of the Lebanese uh, oppose the idea, and since the Syrian revolution, uh, the concept has changed. Now we came to a time where they are not allowing the election to happen because somebody is coming with a project for the integrity of Lebanon and. Uh, wants to do it the democratic way, the normal way. So it turns up that all the MPs, that they are in an alliance with Syria and Hezbollah, uh, boycott the, uh, decide to boycott the uh, election sessions. Are you talking here about the free elected. patriotic movement, Mr. Barakat? Sorry? Are you uh, talking here about the free patriotic movement uh, headed by Michel Aoun? Yes, I wouldn't say, I, I mean, free is, is too much of a word, because actually that's, uh, ev in everything they do, it's inspired by what the, the best interest of Hezbollah and, uh, uh, and the Syrian regime. I mean, if uh, repeatedly uh, uh, Dr. Zaza invites uh, General Aoun to come down to the parliament and uh, 
to follow the democratic way of choosing a president. And mm. he even said to him, if you are, uh, uh, if, you, uh, if they vote for you and you become the new president, I'll be the first one to come and congratulate you and work with you, right? Mm. But let's do it in the parliament. So mm. uh, uh, the, the thing is, if you look at the institutions in Lebanon now, we have practically a paralyzed prime minister, you know, in, in terms of politics. I mean, he can't make a decision, he can't do anything because uh, they dictated uh, uh, to him what to do. And uh, we don't have a, a president for the republic because yes. or they want somebody to be a secretary for the Syrian regime or they don't want anybody at all. And that isn't going to happen. It's about the Lebanese, uh, it's about the integrity of Lebanon and yes. about the hope of the normal Lebanese citizens who mm. want a, a president and institutions yes. to represent them and rather than representing mm. other regimes and other yes. movements. Mr. Barakat, Otherwise, Mr. Barakat, for such a long time, why do you think the West has not made uh, serious efforts to broker an agreement so that the president is elected in Lebanon? I think the, the major problem is uh, and now Lebanon is falling into the, uh, unfortunately, into, into the Iranian camp. Well, I mean, the military power held in Lebanon is, uh, is, is held by Hezbollah, not by the Lebanese army. Or Stay army. with us, Dr. Barakat. I will, uh, Mr. Barakat, I will ask Dr. Simon Waldman, do you believe that Lebanon has gone under the Iranian umbrella? Um, Hezbollah has been has become That's Hezbollah. I'm has talking about very, the state. very powerful. Uh, in terms of the state itself, um, Lebanon is a, a fractured state. And in terms of um, what uh, uh, Mr. Barakat said, in terms of you know, which military is more powerful in, in Lebanon, it is, of course, Hezbollah. Of course, you, know, you, you go to Political Science 101 and they'll tell you what the definition of a state is, and it's a monopoly of violence uh, w within some kind of central government. That doesn't exist, and that allows uh, states such as Iran to be able to have a huge influence. Do you agree, Mr. Barakat? I, I, I agree. I totally. I think the Iranians at the moment, uh, they can dictate the uh, foreign policy of Lebanon. They can dictate uh, the next move of the government, or at least they can block the mm. move if they don't like it. As they are blocking at the moment the election of a new president if it doesn't fall under their umbrella. Yes. And what do you expect out of the, uh, the meeting, the predicted meeting between Hezbollah and the future movement, which is coming soon, supposedly? With all honesty, not much. Because if you remember, uh, in the 2000, uh, was it 2006, when we had the Israeli invasion in Lebanon, yeah? Yes. Uh, Hezbollah was part, uh, was, uh, uh, had members in the, in the government, mm -hmm. and, and they decided to, uh, to go for a military action without even referring to, to the Lebanese government. So, in all cases, they never see the Lebanese government, they never see the institutions. Mm. Uh, uh, they have their own uh, agenda that they're working on. Mm. And I can't see, I mean, I know there is, uh, I hope that something positive comes out of that. Mm. But realistically, I can't see it happening. I mean, you know, uh, 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 at the moment, we're living uh, uh, in the time of the, of the policy, uh, politic of the weapons. Yes. And, and that, you know, the seriousness of those books, I, I, I really can't see how they're going to come out with the, with the result. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. up to this moment. Stay with us, Mr. Barakat. Uh, uh, Mr. Jorge, do you think the P5 plus one, when it comes to the nuclear negotiations with Iran, has put Iran in a situation where supporting Hezbollah at the moment is not its top priority? <laughs> I think... Um, P5-plus-1's approach to Iran generally has some issues, has mm -hmm. some problems. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, uh, Iran's support for Hezbollah, um, just as Iran's support for various other organizations throughout the Middle East, um, poses some problems. Mm -hmm. But if the P5-plus-1 want to achieve peace uh, or a meaningful result when it comes to the nuclear negotiations, then they need to deal with these things as separate issues. Is Hezbollah on the table, do you think, at the nuclear negotiations? Um, Iran is on the table. I mean, that, that, that Iran is without a doubt the one calling the shots. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think it, it's, it's that way that, that these negotiations need to be seen. It Dr. is Mormon? with Iran. Yeah, I, I, if I may, um, 
before the kind of interim agreement with Iran was actually made, Iran was facing a significant crisis because of the sanctions regime was starting to work. It was really biting. And Iran had a choice to make. Was it going to continue to support Syria, the Assad regime, and to support Hezbollah? Or was it going to provide food on the table, commodities for the Iranian people? And what the P5 plus 1 talks did was they they, they eased up in terms of the, the sanctions, allowing Iran to essentially do both. Mm -hmm. um, and that way it, it, it escaped something and it was able to continue to sponsor uh, Hezbollah and the Assad regime. Mm -hmm. Mr. Barakit, uh, some analysts say that Hezbollah's military capabilities will be highly challenged if Hezbollah was fighting in Syria again and had a front with Israel at the same time. Now, even when Hezbollah is avoiding such a scenario, uh, do you think its interference in Syria has jeopardized its main role against Israel? I think, to be honest, uh, Israel being used like uh, the excuse to uh, carry on using the weapons in uh, uh, other wars. I mean, as we've noticed, like since, uh, uh, since uh, 2006, the Israelis never... Uh, uh, invaded Lebanon or never threatened that they want uh, they wanted to invade Lebanon. But what, what happened? A matter of fact, uh, what happened is like uh, Hezbollah did the uh, unacceptable act in Beirut on the seventh of May uh, that everybody remembers. Then now, in the civil war in Syria, uh, is involved up to uh, up to his ears in support in ears in supporting the Syrian regime without even referring to the Lebanese government or the Lebanese people or anything. Mm -hmm. So he dragged into Lebanon. Uh, all sorts of uh, violence and all sorts of uh, uh, problems that we 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 didn't need. Mm -hmm. And even when uh, uh, a group of the 14th of March asked the uh, president to secure uh, to work on securing the borders between Lebanon and Syria to to stop this yes. madness happening, mm -hmm. uh, Hezbollah challenged that decision, and of mm -hmm. course. Uh, uh, nothing could happen because uh, nobody is capable to enforce such, uh, such decision. Mr. Joseph Barakat of the Lebanese Forces Party joined us over the phone from London. Good to have you back on Straightforward. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, George de, de Jesus, uh, what is Turkey's stance on organizations like Hezbollah, especially when it comes to the role uh, Hezbollah played in Syria against ISIS, even before the US-led coalition was initiated? Um, Turkey stands to, to Hezbollah, as with um, many different organizations such as Hezbollah, is a complex one because the dynamics of the region are extremely complex. Mm -hmm. um, Turkey does not like ISIS in any way, shape or form. I'm not, I'm not saying No, no, of course. That's no, no, <laughs> not okay. what I was saying. But Turkey does not like ISIS. Hezbollah um, fights against ISIS. Mm -hmm. um, and so the two, the two parties have things in common. Mm -hmm. However, Turkey is not and will never be too fond of Hezbollah because Hezbollah represents in one, <coughs> in one way, shape or form um, Iranian influence spreading over the region and mm -hmm. the t current Turkish administration is very wary of that and that is not something they want to see done. Mm -hmm. Dr. Waldman, Akiva Eldar says in Al Monitor, um, the, the US must encourage Israeli voters to seek an end to the conflict with the Palestinians. Uh, where do you see this even, uh, where do you see it going, especially when the Kerry initiative was rather unsuccessful? Well, first of all, let me say, um, I enjoy reading uh, Eldar's um, articles, op-eds. Um, I'm a fan of his, but on this particular issue, I must say I, I disagree with him um, profusely. Why? I think it will be a huge mistake for the United States to get involved in the Israeli elections in March. Mm -hmm. especially any reference to the peace process, uh, the Palestine issue, it should just not be said. The reason being is if they do, then hardcore nationalists, those who oppose the peace process will rally behind Netanyahu. And right now the elections are not a foregone conclusion. In addition, um, if Netanyahu wins, he will be very, very angry with the administration. And already they're not on good terms. Mm -hmm. um, and this will just make matters worse. So the best thing to do is to not say anything about the Israeli elections and let the Israeli elections be about um, the, the center ground emerging in Israel, talking about things such as the high cost of living, disparity between rich and poor, because that's essentially what's going to win or lose the election for Netanyahu. And there is a centrist camp emerging in Israel, um, which uh, are, is for the most part pro-peace, and 
to not say anything would give them a better chance. Do you share a similar opinion very briefly? I uh, agree and would go one step further. The USA is not going to, in any way, shape or form, try to encourage Israeli voters. Um, Israeli voters will be encouraged by more peaceful initiatives coming from the Palestinians, mm -hmm. uh, especially with regards to uh, settlers. And Palestine is now taking its cause once again to the UN. What Palestine needs to think about now is what will happen to the settlers if their independence is recognized within the 1967 borders, what will happen to the, s the Israeli settlers already in there? Mm -hmm. That question is what will sway, um, maybe not now, but in the future, mm -hmm. Israeli voters. Mm -hmm. Dr. Boardman, moving on to neighboring countries. Um, Israeli Defense Minister Moshe Yalon hints at further Israeli airstrikes in Syria, and he warns anyone who arms, quote, our enemies, that was in Haaretz and the Jerusalem Post, now, who are Israel's, uh, Israel's enemies today, apart from Hezbollah? Well, it, it, won't, become, it won't be too much of a surprise when I, I tell you who Israel con considers its enemies. Of course, Hezbollah is one, but of course the, the biggest threat that Israel believes it faces is that of Iran. Um, Iran both in terms of a nuclear Iran and also sponsoring uh, organizations such as Hezbollah, to a certain extent Hamas, even though relations between Iran and Hamas are a little bit edgy. So just not ISIS for now? And for ISIS is also a significant threat for Israel as well, especially in terms of the integrity of Jordan. Mm -hmm. And it would possibly be a case that if Jordan is threatened by ISIS, Israel could intervene. It mm -hmm. was involved in saving the Jordanian regime in 1958, 1970. It's not inconceivable that could happen in 2015, 2016 as well. We get back to ISIS and Israel, but now we are joined by British Conservative Party politician and military historian Robert Olds. Welcome back to Straightforward. Thank you. Thank you. How would you look at the UK policy in the Middle East in 2014? And what are, in your opinion, the main events that you would reflect or even criti reflect upon or even criticize? Well, the British policy in 2014 towards, in particular, Israel has been one uh, of continuation. There would always be uh, criticisms of certain Israeli actions, but would give uh, Israel enough diplomatic room for manoeuvre to have uh, the choice to take the actions which they wanted to against uh, Palestinians or Hamas in Gaza. So it's always one of allowing Israel to to do what it wants to do, to take action, as long as that action isn't uh, considered in British eyes too severe. There will be some criticism, but will, of course, uh, really not uh, not uh, end support for the state of Israel. So it's one of continuation, particularly uh, when we look at the Israeli context and the British support for Israel, which has existed since 1956. Mm -hmm. And what does the unsuccessful Kerry peace initiative from one hand and the not more successful US-led coalition in Syria, what do these say about the role of the West and especially the US in the region? Well, the Western policy towards Syria has been one of opposing President Assad and trying to create regime change and in the living in a sort of fantasy world that uh, the Free Syrian Army, which in some cases actually reached agreements with the uh, Assad government, uh, is a credible opposition or credible government. Uh, and in, fa in fact, not respecting the wishes of the Syrian people, most of which do support actually President Assad. And there was a wishful uh, denial, um, ignoring the role of ISIS until, of course, ISIS, which did start in Iraq, uh, in invaded Iraq and threatened the oil producing regions in the north centering around Mosul and then ISIS became an enemy of the United States because it was undermining the American project in Iraq and only then did of course America uh, start to uh, sponsor its, it, its opposition to ISIS in Syria and really recognizing finally that there is a problem of extremism mm. in Syria rather than trying to pretend that uh, all the opposition to President Assad are is one of liberal liberal Democrats uh, opposing the government of of the of President Assad. So really, it is a, a situation where the West is still meddling. It's allowing Israel to attack Assad government forces, especially if they're uh, thought to be uh, giving arms to Hezbollah, and of course trying to continue to create regime change while taking tokenistic bombing against ISIL which, of course, does not compare to the bombing that took place against the uh, government of Libya under Colonel Gaddafi, where, of course, there were m around 50 sorties a day, around 50 attacks a day, trying to overthrow uh, Gaddafi's government within Libya. 
but of course the actions taken against ISIL do not even compare yes. to to what has ta been taken against secular regimes within the Middle East. So there's somewhat of a hypocrisy from the United States, but there is some degree of attacks on ISIS, yes. but not enough. Stay with us, Mr. Olds. Uh, Dr. Waldman here would like to interject. Um, well, I don't think it's a case really of uh, just token attacks against ISIS. Um, the United States, the coalition, have a significant problem here, and that is that they may defeat ISIS if they wanted to, put the boots on the ground, it's difficult if they could, but theoretically they could do that. But then what happens after? Syria is a broken state. In the case of Iraq, it's been divided into different sectarian loyalties as opposed to state loyalties. And that begs the question of what happens next. And it's the after game that the US is playing. The problem for the United States is time is not there on their hands. What I would agree is um, in, in, in terms of the Syrian opposition. Yes, this is for the most part a ragtag force. And yes, the United States are living on a hope and a prayer that somehow that this force is going to be able to defeat ISIS and the Assad regime. Well, we've got to understand why, of course, ISIS exists. It exists because of American interference within Iraq and, of course, its sponsoring of opposition groups within Syria and allowing extremist groups within the Middle East, particularly the Saudis and the Qataris, to push funding and weapons towards the militants which are fighting against the secular regime of President Assad. And that and it isn't interested in having... Uh, a solution. It's interested in regime change and there has not been any thought put together what would happen after the regime change of President Assad, which of course has failed miserably and Assad will still be in power long after Dave, David Cameron has probably left office in 2015 and of course President Obama, who will not be president for well, only for several more years and he's already considered a lame duck president. The Western policy towards Syria has been greatly mistaken. It's all about been wrecking a secular regime, a regime that didn't want to continue trading in the dollar, a regime that wanted to have its own independence and not be part of the Western orbit. And there's been no consideration about what would happen afterwards. And the chaos, of course, is perhaps welcomed by some because it just enables a situation where there is no challenge to Israel within that region because, of course, American policy is firmly behind Israel. It sees Israel as one of the well, the only really properly functioning democratic nation state, although it's excluding uh, a great deal of its mm. population mm. from action uh, activities yes. in, in its democracy, namely the Palestinians. But, mm. but, of course, American policy stands firmly behind Israel. And if our other countries are wrecked, as, uh, and therefore not in a position to challenge Israel, well then that suits American foreign policy aims. Robert Olds, also the author of Montgomery and the First War on Terror. Many thanks again for being with us tonight. Thank you. Dr. Waldman, um, Israel's top ally, the United States, as uh, Mr. Olds has mentioned, is leading the coalition against ISIS. Now why is Tel Aviv not involved in helping America fight its enemy, despite the beheading of an Israeli citizen in September? Yes, uh, the, the Israeli citizen you referred to was a dual national, um, Israeli citizenship and also US citizenship. Mm -hmm. Well, this kind of question reminds me of uh, Menachem Begin, the Prime mm -hmm. Minister of Israel. At the time, his comment when the Iran-Iraq war was taking place in the early 1980s, he was asked, uh, which side would you support? And he said, I wish both sides best of luck. Mm -hmm. And he said that because, uh, of course, the Saddam regime in Iraq was considered an enemy. And so was the, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, and it was a case where he was quite happy to see both sides fight each other out. You can make a very similar claim for the situation today. Mm -hmm. Here there is ISIS, which just by its very ideology is... is completely against the state of Israel and at the same time this is fighting the forces of Assad and also Hezbollah mm -hmm. also sworn so there's a strategy there well I, this is this is a short-term strategy but of course there is the what happens after let's say the Assad regime were was to be successful mm -hmm. it would be more um, it would be in a more powerful position than it was before and this can alter the balance, the arms balance, the strategic balance between yes. Syria, Hezbollah on one side and Israel on the other and perhaps um, cause conflict. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a short-term respite for Israel where things are really looking okay. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. But of course, the longer end game is a lot more mm -hmm. treacherous. And uh, George, could we say that the stances, it's a rather controversial question, could we say that the stances of Israel and <coughs> Turkey are similar over ISIS? Uh, they both seem not too concerned about any security risks that ISIS may impose. Um, I mean, let me, let me disagree with that respectfully, but quite strongly. Mm -hmm. um, to say that Turkey um, is not concerned uh, over ISIS is not true. Right. Um, because I think the reason that, that statement stems from the fact that Turkey has not fully joined the international coalition, which is, which is fair enough, but what we need to understand is that Turkey, better than anyone, recognizes the underlying currents uh, and the complexity of the region. Turkey is doing something, but Turkey is, is demanding, and in my opinion quite rightly so, that the international co uh, co coalition broaden its approach to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. That the international coalition deal with, as well as ISIS, but Bashar al-Assad, which, which the West seems to have completely forgotten, the man is still there committing uh, war, war crimes, and they've completely forgotten him. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that is, of, and of course, you know, the, Turkey has also been calling for the establishment of a no-fly zone and a free mm -hmm. uh, zone in, um, in the north of Syria. So Turkey wants something more. Turkey wants a more efficient approach. And quite recently, actually, the, the Turkish Foreign Minister Çavuşoğlu uh, said something um, quite interesting, uh, th which I think captures uh, this question that we've been talking about, the future, what happens after ISIS. And he talks about redoctrination. He talks about state building. Because that is something that the international coalition has not been thinking about. Because yeah. it is very well and good to defeat ISIS on the ground. But then what? The seeds um, of future terrorism have already been sown by ISIS. They're already training and indoctrinating the young ones. But, so then, you but then you mentioned that Bashar al-Assad is still high on the agenda because of war crimes. So uh, he's high on the where, do you for stand, Turkey, where does Turkey stand on this between ISIS and Assad? Turkey wants ISIS removed and as Assad? much as Assad. Hmm. Exactly. And who's the alternative then? Because ISIS wants to replace Assad. Yes. And the alternative is a viable Syrian regime, which is why for Does it exist? It doesn't, but that, but that is Until something that the international it. coalition mm -hmm. needs to work on creating. Why not the Syrians, even? Or the Syrians. Well, okay. the international co coalition with the Syrians, but something The Syrians needs to be have done. decided, in a way, in the elections, they want Mr. Assad as their president, just like Mr. Olsa said, very for another seven uh, years. No, <laughs> 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 very, very good elections, those, those were. Well, we respect your opinion, no, of course. course. Let me you. just add something, something else in terms of ISIS and Turkey. Um, don't forget, Turkey shares a border with Syria, a large border with Syria. And it is concerned that if it's too forceful against ISIS, then there will be a spillover effect, homegrown terrorism in Turkey. That's what's being talked about all the time mm. in Twitter, in the media, mm. secret cells in different towns and regions in, in, in Turkey. And this is terrifying for the Turkish Republic because it's so close to the Syrian border mm -hmm. and also Iraq as well. And of course, another factor here is, of course, the Kurdish issue. Mm -hmm. And now I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to say that, you know, the way to understand Turkish foreign policy is through, through the Kurdish issue, um, but it is a very, very important factor. Mm -hmm. The creation of some kind of uh, autonomy of the Syrian Kurds, um, especially if under, under the sway of the PKK, is something that Turkey wants to avoid at all costs. And if that means delaying any kinds of kind of action against ISIS, so be it. I, that's mm. what they will do. Mm. And I must add, when, you, when it comes to sentiment against ISIS in Turkey, there was recent statistics that say that a high uh, rate of uh, Turkish people do not necessarily oppose ISIS based on religious reasons. But anyway, now let's get to our other section. 2014 did confuse analysts, journalists and even politicians as to what is going on in the Middle East. US President Barack Obama's foreign policy plans collide with wars abroad and politics at the United States. But apart from partisan criticism, how can we look at the West's policy in the Middle East in 2014? And what are the socio-economic repercussions of volatile political and security situations in the region? And how did ISIS affect the world view of Islam and what needs to be done? Uh, George, uh, do you think President Erdogan of Turkey is disappointed uh, when it comes to his role in the region? Um, I don't think President Erdogan is the kind of man to be disappointed about Why do you role. say so? Because President Erdogan has very clear goals. It, mm. is, it is definitely true that the staunch stance that he has taken... But one of them um, is playing a key role in the region, apparently, no, no, one of, of course, his main but, goals. But more important than that is his own country's security mm -hmm. and his vision for the future of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. this is, he's, he's 
stu uh, stuck by his um, his position because he understands, as I've said, the dynamics of the region, and he feels that the international community uh, is making a mistake mm -hmm. um, in terms of its approach. Mm -hmm. And of course, as was quite rightly said, there is a Kurdish question to take into account. So, President Erdogan, I don't think, is disappointed. I think he's being very cautious, uh, which has led him to be, uh, to a certain extent, put to one side. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I don't think that will, in the long run, matter. Mm -hmm. And I know you're a humanitarian enthusiast, so let's touch a little bit on that. Carol Giacomo says in the New York Times that uh, despite the brutal civil war and people displaced and, and, and all the misery that is going on there with the refugees, many powerful states did not really settle uh, refugees on, and give them a boat. Of course. So, uh, what, what if we look say? at the the most recent statistics uh, released by the by the UN, the countries with the most refugees are the mo at the moment are Lebanon and Turkey, mm -hmm. uh, two countries that don't don't have as uh, as many resources as the West, for example, uh, but who are making a genuine effort, uh, be it limited and at times flawed, but are making a genuine effort mm -hmm. to to give a home, a temporary home to these refugees. Now, what the West has done, or not done in this case, the West not taking in refugees, has been shameful. Uh, Germany uh, is the country in the West that has pledged to take the most refugees. I think 20,000 is, is, is the number. Why is but Germany sort of a role model and it has a say when it comes to that? Because it seems it's doing well. Why do you think Germany particularly is keen on its reputation when it comes to humanitarian support? Because, I th well, on the one hand, Germany has the financial capability to do so, despite the crisis. On the other hand, Germany is trying very, very hard to establish its position on the world stage. And I think um, this might be a way for, for it to, to gain that respect across the world. Mm -hmm. But there have been countries which can uh, and which have the resources to do so, to take in these refugees, such as the USA, such as the UK, mm -hmm. uh, who are not making a genuine effort. And of course, let's not even talk about Russia or China, who we haven't really heard from at all when it comes to the refugee crisis. Uh, let me talk to uh, Dr. Waldman. What do you think, what are the long-term risks on, on, on Europe, if any, if these refugees were offered a boat here? Well, um, long-term risks would be along the lines of, well, we don't necessarily know who these refugees are, um, what their, if any, political uh, affiliation they may have. But for the most part, I do agree with George. I, I think it would be a, a very positive gesture if uh, the West not just intervene or, or be involved in Syria Iraq, but also were to have refugees um, as well to take them in. I think it would be a very important gesture. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm all for um, a humanitarian refugee pro uh, policy. But can I challenge you, when you mentioned we don't know who these people are and who they support, does it really matter who they support back home? We, we still have political parties operating in the UK. Some support right-wing politicians in the Middle East, some don't. As long as it's, they, they are here peacefully, how does it matter, really? Sure. Um, the problem with refugee issues is they are, they are not just a humanitarian question. They have a lot of political undertones as well. Mm -hmm. um, with refugeeism also, also is associated with extremism, mm -hmm. radicalization as well. But and this is something which is, of course, terrifies. Yes. But the UK and other countries Indeed, sometimes and that's are exporting these people to the Middle East, so it's a two-way road, I think. Sure. But anyway, we are now joined uh, by Dr. Sundus Abbas, political scientist, joining us over the phone. Welcome to Straightforward. Dr. Abbas? Yep. Dr. Abbas, how would you reflect and maybe assess the, the handling of the West in Iraq in the recent, in the recent crisis, minority crisis particularly, and especially when it comes to the Turkmens in Iraq being the third largest ethnic group in Iraq. Well, uh, no doubt that ISIS um, attacked all the group in uh, Iraq and Syria, regardless their ethnicity or uh, their sects or religion. But uh, we can see the groups that uh, they've been marginalized and they've been disempowered in Iraq they've been uh, hit with ISIS even more. Uh, let us not forget um, these groups, especially like Turkmen, which they consider that they are um, the third largest uh, ethnicity in Iraq. Uh, but yet, uh, through these years, they've been marginalized, they've been um, uh, eliminated from the holding um, important positions. And all these territories, their territories, they've be, they've been 
uh, vacuum, uh, security vacuum in there. So it was a very easy target for the terror group for years, not mm -hmm. just after ISIS. Even before that, we have resolution from the European Parliament regarding that, condemning what's happening to Turkmen. Yet Iraqi government and the um, Kurdish government, they didn't do anything about, about their um, suffering, about their atrocities. And, um, but after ISIS, even, you know, these atrocities even started to be uh, even more and more. Mm. Let us not forget all the ter ter uh, territories, like from Tel Afar, Shiri Khan, around the villages around Mosul, uh, Bashir, Taza, um, Amerli, Tuz Hormat, all these places, are either they've been uh, under control of ISIS or under threat of controlling ISIS. Mm -hmm. So, um, as I said, it's just like um, the vac security vacuum in these places yes. and neglect from the uh, Iraqi government and Kurdish government left them without the defending forces in these areas. So it was easy target for ISIS. Mm -hmm. Stay with us, Dr. Abbas. Uh, George de Jesus, uh, can I ask you about other minorities in the region, in Iraq particularly, the Christians were eradicated, especially now with Christmas coming. How, would, how does a European like yourself think of this? I and mean, We've even seen an initiative by the Prince of Wales in London in joining the Iraqi community in, in a gesture to support the Christians of Iraq. What do you think of the handling there? It's what's happened to Christians in, in Iraq and, and elsewhere across the Middle East. Um, of currently facing ISIS uh, is without that a tragedy. Um, they're not going to go back anytime soon. It's that simple. Um, is that the plan, do you think? I, it, it's not that it's the plan, it's the reality of the situation. Mm -hmm. um, ISIS's brutality is um, extreme. And, and of course, Iraq is not at the moment a country that, uh, as we've just heard with regards to, to the Turkmen's, you know, it does not. Um, stand up for the rights of all of its citizens, uh, be it the administration in Baghdad, be it the Kurdish administration. Uh, and so I, what I think we have seen is uh, the ones that were lucky enough to leave is a, a Christian exodus from um, Iraq. And I really don't see them going back anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Dr. Abbas, as a women's rights activist, uh, you would most likely agree that the Islamic rhetoric on women in the region has changed. We've seen things shift dramatically under ISIS. Are women going to be paying the highest price there? Well, absolutely, I agree with you. The most devastated um, people in Iraq now are the moment uh, women. You see the ISIS, you, see, um, you know, they, uh, they t took them as a slave, some of them, and they've been raped by ISIS, and they've been forced to leave their jobs, even the uh, places uh, like Mosul uh, under control of the ISIS. The women there, they can't work properly. Uh, they just ban them from working, and they force them to wear certain clothes. Uh, at the places they've been under control, whoever, um, you know, avoid them is just like they've been their uh, destiny. They've been either raped them or killing them. or. What are you doing about it as, as a director of a Women's uh, Leadership Institute in Iraq? Sorry, I didn't get your um, uh, what, what are you? What are you or people like yourself doing about it to, so as to alleviate uh, the, the repercussions or even avoid the repercussions that ISIS will be leaving on women in the region? Well, uh, at the moment we are trying to um, reach their voice over uh, here for the uh, human rights institutions um, just to get help, uh, more help, because these women, not just they've been in suffering and they've been through dramatic, um, um, horrific stories, but it's going to be affect them for a long time term mentally because they lost their children, they lost their husbands, and they were, um, they've seen um, such a horror, um, um, you know, scenes over there. So they, they are going to suffer. So we're trying to help them as much as we can. Although at the moment, some of the places really, we can't reach them. And some of the places, um, it's like um, uh, yeah, some of the women, they don't come with the story because um, they, for the conservative uh, families, although they've been through lots of atrocity over there, but mm. they are embarrassed to just um, uh, to um, you know say it in the front of their families and uh, relatives. So they just keep it quiet. They don't don't come up and speak up about what they have been through. So we can uh, we be able to help them even more. Mm, and I think perhaps uh, you you would agree that including women in uh, the government of, of Mr. Al Abadi would definitely help in that department. 
Uh, well, at the moment, uh, well, you know, it's just like the government, they are really, they have the other priorities. I can't see our women in the parliament really doing much to help the women in these places. Mm -hmm. they, they have much more duty to help them and to be there with them and, you know, to do something about it. Yes, Dr. Sundus Abbas, the executive director of the Women's Leadership Institute in Baghdad in Iraq and women's rights activist in the country as well. Thank you very much for your participation. Uh, sorry, I can't, can I correct something? Yes, please. I'm not head of the um, right, uh, human, uh, uh, women's rights in Baghdad. I'm representing Iraqi Turkmen in the United Kingdom. Apologies for the confusion. Thank you very much again. Uh, thank you. Uh, Georgia de Jesus, uh, also the Jordan Times, says there is a pressing need for a regional conference to re-educate Muslims on the true values of Islam. Now, this is clearly related to the view on ISIS. What, in your opinion, could be done after all what's happened? Well, without a doubt, such a conference and such an approach is what needs to be done. I've, I've already mentioned that there is a, a desperate need for uh, redoctrination mm. after um, after the military conflict is over. Um, and, but this redoctrination cannot be, and it cannot be, um, the West trying to teach Muslims what it is to be a Muslim. Islam is, um, from what I've learned, um, a beautiful religion, intrinsically. Um, and we must work with um, moderate institutions on the ground. Mm. Um, to Who are these? Uh, do, do they exist under ISIS anyway? You said moderate institutions. Mod moderate institutions in the Muslim world that are against ISIS and that, yes. and that are against this interpretation and this abuse of Islam because that is exactly what we are seeing. Mm -hmm. Because ISIS is not a reflection of Islam. I ISIS is um, and a reflection of an entity which is using and abusing religion to achieve political ends. Mm -hmm. right? So what we need to do, uh, what the international coalition needs to do, is to work with moderate institutions on the ground to help people, uh, to redoctrinate people mm -hmm. and to get them back on the right course. Simon, is there, Dr. Warman, is there hope in that department? Well, um, myself personally, um, I, I'm a secularist. Um, in fact, I'm an atheist. And uh, the idea of any kind of religious education is something which I, I just don't like. I think that's something that belongs in the home. I think if anything that should happen publicly, it is rational thought, cri critical thinking. This is what needs to be taught instead. Um, and I think that's the most important thing. And this will allow people to question what uh, a, a preacher, an imam, may tell them. Um, it question what their parents tell them so they can think for themselves and that way you can reduce radicalization and radicalism in the Middle East. And do you think it is, it is valid to, to uh, apply this approach in a very religious world, especially the Islamic world? Well again, I think the answer here is that religion is something which belongs in the home. It's not something which should be on public space, it's not something which should be state-sponsored, it's not something which should uh, be allocated public funds to, and I think that's something that should be applied in the Middle East, in Europe, in North America, everywhere. But the most, the most supposedly, or perhaps the only democratic state in the region, which is Israel, uh, recently declared or tried to pass a, a bill where Israel is a Jewish state. So again here bringing, uh, people are buying into this rhetoric uh, of religious identity even at the level of the state. Well, uh, I agree with you in th that's what happened. Um, the idea of a, of a Jewish state bill um, was, 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 was horrible. It was a terrible thing to, to develop in Israel. Um, and um, instead, what I think that Israel actually needs is a secular revolution. Mm -hmm. um, it needs to have a total separation of church and state, in this, in this case synagogue and state, whereby religion is just something in the home. And that way, I think you can solve a lot of Israel's problems, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jorge? Um, I'm a secularist myself, but I, I, I have to... Um, disagree with you on, on, on that approach. Um, I think promoting that would be a problem because it is promoting a Western European worldview onto a, a region of the world where as it stands at the moment it will not take hold. Um, the, the Middle East is uh, a, well, uh, contains various societies where religion still plays a very very important part and to to link religion to, radi uh, to, to radicalism, um, I, don't, I don't think that that argument holds. I think radicalism would happen even if um, 
the Middle East was a secular, because radical, it was a secular region, because radicalism it, it can take many different forms. The, it doesn't matter what the ideology itself is. Um, so I don't agree that secularism should mm -hmm. be imposed. Plus, when you're talking about um, secularism and, for example, Islam, you cannot, I mean, a separation of church and state, what does that mean? There is no church in Islam. Islam, um, there, there is no supreme entity. So a different approach, when that time comes in the Middle East, a different approach to secularism must be taken. I don't believe the Middle East is at that stage yet, and I don't think that is necessarily a bad thing. If I, if I just quickly may, um, when it comes to um, you know, who in the Middle East this should be supported, well, you know, my support goes with Middle East and secularists, Middle East atheists, um, whose voice is very rarely heard in some countries in the Middle East. And um, I, I think that for religion to actually grow, the best place for religion to actually have a voice is in a secular state. Take the example of the United States, for example, where you have large churches, you have very rich mm -hmm. churches, almost a, a whole Bible belt, if you like. That has only been able to um, happen because there is no official state religion in the United States, allowing um, competition between different churches to emerge and a multiplicity of different views of uh, people who are religious. And from religious reform or rebranding and humanitarian sufferings in the Middle East, let's now tackle the economy. We are joined by Dr. Nasser al kalawun economic analyst uh, based here in London. Welcome to our discussion. Yes, hello. What are the main repercussions, in your opinion, that this year's instability has left on Mideast economies, oil trade and the stock market? Well, to start with, the stock markets in the Middle East are relatively uh, small and they are on the uh, perhaps the uh, fringe economies. So I wouldn't, uh, apart from some GCC uh, 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 stock markets, it's, um, it's relatively uh, not that affects uh, people that much. Uh, but uh, in matters of oil trade, uh, it's been good till about three months ago and that now the what what uh, looks like a lock and horns between uh, powers inside OPEC and between OPEC and other producers, it makes the future a bit bleak in matters of income, especially for countries which has uh, sanctions uh, uh, applied to them. Are you talking about Iran. Iran here? Pardon? Are you talking about Iran and Syria here? Yes, Iran and, and uh, Iran in, in particular, mm. uh, but also Iraq is outside uh, uh, the quota of OPEC, no matter it's inside OPEC as a founding member of OPEC, but its, it's uh, production of nearly 3 million is outside OPEC, which puts more pressure uh, on the economies. Mm. So, and Dr. al Kalawun, so, tell us about the countries that are or could be at the highest risk if the political and security scenario did not really change. In short, I'll, I'll enumerate them in matters of two countries, it's Yemen and Libya. And Why Libya, so? Yes, and Libya for a reason. Libya is a rich state. It has $200 billion in its own you know, uh, sovereign wealth fund. Mm -hmm. However, the poor management and the infighting um, uh, you know, uh, between the factions can threaten, uh, threaten Libya to split into two or can invite, which I see more likely, a kind of Egyptian-Algerian intervention to the border areas to create kind of safe haven for whatever reason. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't uh, suffer from uh, lack of funds, it, su it suffers from political instability. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, Yemen, it has both, it, it is, it's poor, it's been, uh, there is on the, uh, on the horizon the, you know, the, the association or a kind of group of countries uh, uh, France of Yemen, it failed to deliver over five years at least between UK, Saudi Arabia and other countries. And uh, uh, there is a faction, the Houthis are now uh, uh, getting uh, victory, but victory on the back of poverty, mm. which means split up of the country. That's what I fear uh, in the near future into different parts. But Dr. al Kalawun, meanwhile, the GCC economies seem to be doing very well. Dubai, for instance, is getting back to growth. Uh, since the crash of 2008. And what keeps these economies, the oil economies of the GCC, so immune? Well, uh, the word immune, I think, doesn't apply. Immune, let's divide it into two parts. First yes. of all, uh, uh, immune in a sense that they have enough funds 
and the reserve to withstand a meltdown of the oil uh, uh, price for at least three years. That's number one. Mm. Immune number two is that because they don't have debts, save for Dubai to Abu Dhabi and others, yes. uh, other banks. So in a way, in this sense, they are safe in the short term. Mm. But on the other hand, they are not immune to the international market, to the commodities prices, you know, food stuff and, and, and other, uh, you know, imported stuff, cars and whatever industries. Yes, but so what, in, what I meant is that they are, they are immune and why they are immune in, in the sense that nothing is stopping their growth despite all the instability in the region. And we do know they have investments in Egypt, Libya, Algeria, Tunisia and so on. Syria, that's either. right. That's right. But if, if the uh, oil price gets uh, to stay for at least a year or two and this uh, under sixty dollars, I think they will withdraw their own investment or at least be under pressure in the midterm, which means mm. three years from now. But short term, they are not in trouble. Mm. Dr. Nasser Al Kalawun, economic analyst based here in London. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Carl. Dr. Waldman, I'll have to ask you and uh, Mr. Uh, George the same question, and it's the last question. Um, what do you think, and without sounding that we're speculating, what are, in your opinion, the options now for the region and uh, the best options, especially when it comes to Syria? Well, <laughs> that is speculative, um, and I can only speculate. Um, the, or predict. Or, or even try to predict. I, I don't think I can, to be honest with you. If I'm going to make a, a, a prediction, that is that unfortunately, unfortunately, this is not a crisis which is just going to go away. ISIS will not be defeated uh, in 2015. It may be the case that it will spill over into the next presidency after Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. So this is something which has to be addressed for the next two to three years. And um, as, as George was correct in saying, after that becomes the really difficult work, the state building process or rebuilding states both in Syria and Iraq, and this is a difficult undertaking. But what's the best option in Syria now between ISIS and Assad? What's the alternative even, if you can't choose? I don't think we're talking about a best option here. Um, what has to somehow emerge is the, is the best of, of two very, very bad options. Mm. Um, it seems that you know, any kind of de democratic reform is now off the table. It's not going to happen. If Syria is ever going to become a, a pluralistic state, um, a, a state with strong state institutions, that doesn't look like that's going to happen anytime soon. So it's only bad news, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. And what's also shocking as well is just the extent of violence and the loss of life. 200,000 people at least have been killed in Syria, millions of refugees, and it doesn't look as if it's reached its peak yet. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mr. George de Jesus, are you as realistically pessimistic? Um, well, I, yes, I agree with, very much with, with what's been said. But above all, what we need to start seeing is, from the West um, and from the international coalition, um, an expansion of their approach to the conflict in the Middle East. We need to see, and I'm staunch on this, we need to see a removal of Bashar al-Assad. Um, he is just as bad. As, as the Islamic What about States. the region? Uh, the the region the as a whole, State and as I've said before, um, we need to focus more than now more than ever on, on redoctrin uh, redoctrination and state building. Mm -hmm. And what the West also cannot do is ignore the refugees. I mean, this is a, mo a very mo multifaceted um, Did you know also issue. that Turkey took on board a lot of refugees? Turkey did, indeed, that is true. But Turkey uh, only has so many resources, and mm -hmm. Turkey's um, current refugee system is, is being very, very strained. And mm -hmm. Turkey needs help mm -hmm. from the international community, which is, it is not getting. Mm -hmm. So we do need um, a much more effective approach if we are to see long-lasting peace mm -hmm. in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the list of rather unorthodox Mideast events this year is crowned today by the Tel Aviv announcement yesterday, quote, Israel's military is exploring the possibility of cooperation with the Lebanese army to counter jihadi militants. Even though the two countries remain technically at war, we will get back to that hopefully in the new year. And as the progress of the US-led airstrikes against ISIS is being questioned at Capitol Hill, the humanitarian crisis caused by the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria remains perhaps the biggest scar on the face of the world leaders and even organizations. We do hope these sufferings will be alleviated upon the new year and at the soonest. And at this, as this episode of a turbulent year comes to an end, I'd like to thank our guests here at the studio, Dr. Simon Waldman, political analyst and lecturer at King's College, 
and Mr. Uh, George de Jesus, humanitarian enthusiast and Middle East expert, and our other interlocutors who engaged briefly, Dr. Sundus Abbas, director of Iraq's Women's Leadership Institute in Baghdad and representative of the Turkmen in Iraq, and Mr. Robert Olds of the British Conservative Party and the Bruges Group, Dr. Nasser al Kalawun, London-based economist, and Mr. Joseph Barakat of the Lebanese Forces. Now stay tuned on Straightforward, Levant TV, and we'll be back with you again soon. Thanks for watching and bye for now.